So yeah, uh, just to get us started here, um, kind of just want to go around and hear a little bit about how each of you came to be involved with this movie, and then I want to dig into the movie itself. So uh, I actually, the year before, filmed um, a film called uh, The Obscure Life of the Grand Duke of Corsica in Malta. Um, and it was with um, the same production company as The Seed. So um, from shooting that film, I then got sent The Seed uh, and just said, you know, what are your thoughts? You know, would you be interested? Um, so yeah, that was kind of my opening. Um, and I obviously read the script and thought, this is madness. I have to know more. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then auditioned. Um, and uh, that's where I met Chelsea. Me and Sophie already knew each other, but yeah. Nice. Um, Chelsea, do you want to jump in? What was your, yeah. how did you get um, in? So I initially just auditioned. I actually got asked to audition for Dee and Charlotte at one point. And then, yeah, I just sort of like did the tapes and then and then it was like um, a physical audition. It was really, really weird because it was like mid pandemic. And I think it was mm -hmm. the first like face to face audition I'd done in about like a year and a half. It was very bizarre. Um, and Sam kind of did it in like almost like a workshop type of um, environment, which is always really nice. I think like rather than sort of like being very you know, stagnant sort of thing. Um, yeah, and it, yeah, and one of those rounds I met Lucy, which was which was lovely, and then eventually met Sophie on set. Nice, and then that that leads us very naturally to you, Sophie. Um, yes. So I was these two gorgeous girls are in the UK, and then I'm I'm in Dublin. So I got the the self tape sent to me from my agent. Um, what are your thoughts? And then I originally uh, auditioned for Charlotte. And then I had a meeting on Zoom with Sam. And he was like, hmm, why don't you read for Heather and Deirdre? So then I think I read for all parts at one stage and then back to Heather and he was like, what are you thinking? And we kind of like discussed about each character and um, kind of figured out which one would be best for me. And then got the job and went to Malta. And that's where the craziness started. It was almost the ultimate pandemic movie if you would have just played all the parts. <laughs> one <laughs> yeah. location, one actress, of that five characters. Yeah. yeah, I think Sam wanted it was all, like all the actors that um, went for for each of the roles. He changed them all up because I think I think he was sort of like trying to push what people were capable of and like you know mm. see where sort of like fit and also what you were you know more comfortable with like I expressed more that I was like I really want to play this character I really wanted to play Charlotte and I and I think that he was just trying to gauge what what he was looking for because you never really know until you see it I think like you know when you're making a film as a director like until it's right in front of you you just you know just want to like test some stuff out I think that was his sort of I'm guessing that was his process. Well, I, I personally love uh, films like this that are, uh, I mean, pandemic aside, that are sort of isolated and take place kind of primarily in, you know, where people are separated from society in a, in a way. And um, it's got that claustrophobia to it. And then this movie also, you know, it has body horror. It has, it, it kind of, bless you, it kind of crosses over into a lot of different uh, genres that fall kind of under the broader thriller or horror umbrella um what do each of you remember about some of those early conversations with sam as far as the tone of what he was going for and like the the type of movie that this would end up being um i think like when we were um when we first started i think what was really interesting was um when you read it you, you obviously don't know exactly how it's going to sort of play out but like um when sophie came on board as heather she really brought like a lot of like dry humor that I didn't initially read on the paper. Do you know what I mean? So it, it kind of really like that for me, like I was like, oh, this is, this works. This is like not what I kind of imagined. And it was like really interesting because it's like, obviously it's got very dark, but then you have these like, like hilarious moments. And Sophie's actually like naturally very, very funny. So it was definitely like, like interesting to see Heather in a completely different way as to how I pictured her or, or how I might have read her like previously. So yeah, it was interesting, fun. 
Yeah, I, th I think Heather had a little bit more um, room to kind of play with. She wasn't written in a certain way. Um, so I kind of had to, I, I, I got the opportunity to kind of make her my own and kind of mold her into, you know, uh, my vision. And, and um, I was saying earlier that it's, it's when I'm playing a character, it's very important for me to kind of find the common ground uh, between the character and, and myself, you know, to give that authentic performance. And I felt like I was, I was, I was allowed and in, in, I was given a lot of room and space to do so, where the other characters were very like, you know, Dee was just a powerhouse and like the alpha female and Charlotte was very strong. And again, the other, they're both like opposite of the scales where I was in the middle, you know, mm -hmm. and I didn't, so I kind of, um, yeah, which was, which was great that I had that kind of opportunity to do that. Yeah, it'd be sort of the, the balancing force between these two poles of mm -hmm. like the, the glue. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm dying to ask this because, it, you know, you think about like watching a lot of the behind the scenes stuff for The Mandalorian, you know, with uh, Baby Yoda, you hear mm -hmm. a lot from people in the cast and people in the production, Great you know, time. someone even just walking by, like thinking of the little Baby Yoda puppet as like real. You know, and people taking pictures, holding it, and that was just they're treating it like um, like it's a, another actor sort of. Was there any similar experience uh, with with this movie and the uh, the creature effects and so on? We weren't really allowed to touch it, were we? No, <laughs> it was no, very I, expensive. <laughs> yeah, I got to carry it like I got to carry it like around a few times. But it's funny, like we were saying that earlier, like none of us are very like our characters. So you know, obviously. As an actor, you find you know the common ground with you who you are and who the character is, but we're all very, very different to our characters. And I think like I was like, oh, this thing is grim. I like it's disgusting. <laughs> and they're like, it's, like, it's a complete opposite to Charlotte, who's like wants yeah. to hold it and carry it. And I was like, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So like it, uh, yeah, it was. But the um the um was it Dan the guy who was the the puppeteer? Um, he was really, really, really wonderful and very, very, very clever. So. Yeah, and, and I love just those practical effects that just, you know, make it, I would imagine as performers, it makes it easier. I, I mean, I guess in some cases, if the practical effects are bad, maybe it makes it more difficult, but it, I would imagine it makes it easier to kind of get into the whole thing when there's, you know, you're not just looking at a tennis ball on a green screen or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I'm also curious, I, I know a lot of filmmakers who work in, you know, such beloved celebrated genres like this sometimes they'll have homework for their performers of like you know maybe watch these films or was there any were there any conversations like that or was there anything that you were able to draw upon as far as references of like the kind just you know tone and atmosphere and stuff like that mm, I think like we had conversations with Sam um early on about like the sort of like tone of how you wanted the film you know he's like it's almost sort of like 70s gory mm. you know kind of retro in a way and very like sort of out there it's the the story is not it's not like a a very linear um horror story that's just you know it's it's kind of out there it's like it's a bit bizarre and it's a bit weird and it's a bit mm -hmm. like gooey and and I think like there was a lot of like visual references that Sam kind of like presented us with and and I think that get like gave us a, a good idea of how he how he wanted it to be yeah we had a lot of rehearsals as well we, we I think we um got there 10 days or two weeks before we started filming um to allow us to kind of run lines, have meetings with with Sam. Let's like all get on the same page. Um, yeah. I have to say, I feel out of place not being blonde right now. <laughs> He's just a new blonde. He's a new blonde. He wasn't blonde before. No, he wasn't. <laughs> um, so I think- a big thing <laughs> in the blonde crew. Yeah. Mm. So I'll, I'll have, maybe I can get just get some of the like grocery store uh, box bleach. Let's see what I can do. Yeah, yeah, you've <laughs> got to get beard in there as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I love that horror in general, and especially a lot of those like seventies films. Uh, as much as on the surface there are these brutal or scary tales, 
they almost always work as some kind of social allegory, the really good ones. And oftentimes even a satire without being like slapstick or funny. And I think this movie lives really well in that place of like, it has something to say beyond just the story, which you can just get into the story and follow it. But also there's kind of commentary happening and there, and there's humor without it being like, you know, a comedy. Uh, if each of you could talk a little bit about kind of what the movie has to say, I guess, about uh, our current social climate and, uh, narcissism and self-obsession and and being kind of led around by this you know desire we all have for the approval of strangers or <laughs> whatever it is that's happening in society right now um if each of you could kind of talk about a little bit of that uh, the kind of satirical part of the movie curious well, about that. uh yeah i i would think oh, well i know as far as like deirdre is concerned as in like that is her life it's that influence of life it's you know it's getting those likes, it's getting, you know, it's constantly like a, a decision to just see opportunity and putting yourself out there. But really, I think what, I mean, Sam and I wanted to show eventually was that it's empty, as in like, as in like, what at the end of it, it's like, it's just, well, mm. what Sam wanted to show is that it's destruction, <laughs> I think. But the point is, is that it's like, there's no happiness there. It's, uh, you know, you're chasing an empty dream, really, you yeah. know, because you do the the more isolated you are and I think that's really I mean for us three I think we all know that don't we it's that yeah social media um it can be so fantastic in some ways but um it, it is a bit of an empty hole if you get yeah. if you take it too seriously I think um well you end up, end up sort of like seeking validation from people that don't actually care about you or you know and don't it's very strange in in my eyes like it's very it's a very weird thing to like one and I think people get addicted to that feeling as well that validation and that like sense of popularity and mm. I think there's also like I think there's a sense of belonging in in our social climate with the kind of like you know online like reactions to stuff which is kind of scary in a way because it almost feels like we're coming away from like real human contact mm. and I think that that's one thing that Charlotte really wants like she wants human contact like and I think that's why she's like I don't want to be involved in this thing I just like I want to enjoy my time with you guys I think she sort of sees that this is like this is not this is not how life should be like we shouldn't be just doing things for for popularity it's not like you know I think that's that's something that I personally really sort of connected with Charlotte and found it really interesting and refreshing I found her refreshing like um amidst all of the other stuff that was going on yeah yeah I'm on the same page I was when I was reading the the script in the first place uh when I was auditioning I I thought it was quite clever how the alien was kind of a metaphor for this social media um you know this relative new phenomenon that's crash landed into our world and has been capable to consume us you know that kind of way and it can be it can be uh disguised in, in quite a desirable way mm -hmm. and and throughout the film it just shows how toxic it can become and how you lose yourself in it mm. yeah like it feels good at first and yeah. then you know and then you're like oh this feels nice you know being liked by people being like by random people appreciating you for yeah. whatever reason, you're doing nothing and then suddenly before you know it you care you know mm. yeah. and then you're down this like rabbit hole of, and then like, you care when you're not liked by by a stranger yeah, exactly. yeah. Exactly. and it's just like this yeah 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 it's also right. like it, it also brings the issue of like because then you do start caring and then you pretend to be someone else and then you're not being true to who you really are and I think that's kind of also like damaging I think that you can't be likable 100% of the time we're all human right. beings but it's you know like people need to realize that everybody has faults and like it's not we don't need to be ashamed of them we don't have to pretend that we're like perfect all the time and I think it's also damaging for other people especially like younger demographics seeing people who look like they have this beautiful life look like they're amazing all the time and it's just not it's just not reality and mm -hmm. I, I think it can be quite that's quite scary you know? and you look at your own life and you're like well my, why isn't my life like how this one appears to be yeah like why am I not in Barbados like wearing all these <laughs> right. amazing expensive outfits yeah. what, where have I gone wrong in life yeah. what have I, yeah. why, why is it my skin perfectly smooth oh this person yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. like why does my face move <laughs> <laughs> yeah my face moves why 
Yeah, it, it, and it it really uh, it's interesting how you can get a hundred pieces of positive feedback, but the one negative, you know, that's the thing that you you know they say, don't, they say don't read the comments, right? And it's like oh, it's the one negative comment that can like crush you for days yeah. at a time. It, yeah. No matter how much positive you know stuff you're getting from people, and also uh, to your point about the false you know the idea that we are all flawed we do make mistakes because we're all living our lives so publicly right now we're making mistakes and failing in public and there's like no room for that <laughs> you know like yeah. you, can't, you can't make a mistake in public yeah. like I think there's a lot of I'm um, there's a lot of this like kind of cancel culture that's going on at the moment and like I think you know, so, like sometimes it's necessary for people to be like, this person shouldn't have a platform and, and, and you, know, like, you know, like in extreme cases and, you know, like hate speech and, and that kind of stuff. But on the milder like topics, I think canceling someone because you don't agree with one thing or you don't like them or whatever, I think that's really scary because that closes the conversation and that's mm -hmm. not something that want to be doing we want to open a conversation how do you educate someone if you are only one-sided or you're not willing to listen or you're not kind of how do you change that person's mind if you just go no that's not going to make them want to listen it's not going to make them sort of you know open up their ideas it just and I think that's I think that's terrifying yeah we've we've really fallen into this idea of punitive justice as opposed to restorative and mm -hmm. punitive justice is really fun in horror films and in revenge tales and you know seeing someone get their comeuppance but in real life I, I would like to think that we would be more in favor of restorative and instead of just like okay yeah. this, this person messed up they're exiled from society it's like no how do we bring this person around to you mm -hmm. know absolutely a, a, where's the redemptive part of the arc like yeah. we, we're missing that from our real life storytelling yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that's what's interesting about like the, the dynamic with the characters as well is like I think that they're all really really different but they obviously all adore each other despite all the things that they don't necessarily agree with you know it's a lot of things like that Charlotte's character is you know thinks Dee's maybe a little bit too much you know she thinks she's a little bit of a narcissist but she loves her deep down because all like she knows that Dee loves her as a friend and I think that that like carries through through all, all the way do you know what I mean and I think it is the same like you know with Heather and Dee and they're like oh god Charlotte can be really really boring but you know they take the good and the bad together and I think that's a really really beautiful thing it's a really good sisterhood and I think like it's lovely that they're all different and they respect their differences and I think that's really beautiful yeah um so last thing uh before we run out of time without getting into spoiler territory uh you know a lot of my favorite films are movies that I like to watch more than once uh do, do you feel that this is a film that reveals new things with repeated viewing <laughs> <laughs> no I've you know I, like I've only I've actually I only watched I've only watched it once so um i mean obviously i think it's like when you watch anything um you know every time you every time you watch something you see something different or you see yeah. something and i and i know that i know that sam loves things like that you know like there's like t tiny details which i know that he um put a lot of time into and like there were things that we were like what's this for and you know yeah so i think definitely they are definitely there um so yeah yeah I didn't mean <laughs> to say that you all had to have watched it 10 times I, I just yeah I've no, made I, it I, to be aware of yeah, so, uh, yeah 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 <laughs> very cool uh well thank you so much all three of you for making the time to do this today I uh, greatly appreciate it and I this is uh a film that I think the not fest audience in particular will enjoy and get behind so it's lovely to speak with all of you and especially you having uh Sophie in Dublin as an Irish American <gasps> give, a, give a shout out there I've, I've never done this before so i don't know why i did that I <laughs> I've, I've got a little shamrock in there so isn't it isn't it patty's day my saint patrick tattoo so yeah. and it is almost and it all is almost saint patrick's day yeah so slancha <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny i was doing a tape yesterday and, and that was one of the lines Slancha. oh no way yeah, yeah. <laughs> so funny that's awesome. I was, right, well, I was embodying my Sophie because she was from Dublin. So. <laughs> <laughs> I have to play a character from Dublin. I'm going to act like Sophie. 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's awesome. Um, Curious. Well, thanks so much, all three of you. Have a good rest of your night. Bye, lovely to meet you. Bye, lovely to meet you, Ryan.